Her, her father was a, a district judge or a district attorney, yeah. So come on, help me welcome Coy Pee. Coy Pee. Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, yeah, my dad's not the district attorney in Knight County for some time now, so you can't hold any of that against him or me. Um, so yeah, I was the performance improvement person both in Carson City and at NAMS, and um, I was a clinical program planner in Carson City, and I remain the agency director at NAMS, that's still the case. What Joe's referring to is some reorganization that we're doing at NAMS, um, and so uh, this, this helps a lot explain um, some of the changes that we're making. Catherine Bachman, who's the agency director for rural services, is supervising our outpatient staff. So I used to supervise inpatient and outpatient. Right now I'm supervising inpatient. I'm still managing the budget for the whole agency. Um, Catherine continues to manage the budget for rural services and um, be the agency director for rural services and she's supervising the outpatient staff. Um, Catherine has enormous um, experience with Medicaid. She wrote some of those chapters for Medicaid for Nevada. So um, because it is highly critical right now that um, the state mental health services maximize our Medicaid revenue, um, Catherine is managing those staff to reorganize and make sure we're getting as much of that revenue in as possible. It used to be this time of year, Joe and I remember a lot of this, this time of year we were going to the legislature and asking for general fund money and that's how we got our money. They didn't cut my pay, thank you. <laughs> Um, now uh, our budgets are largely built on revenue projections, Medicaid being the primary source of that. So it's very critical that we have um, our work organized so that we can bring in that Medicaid revenue and make sure that um, we're bringing in, which also allows the state to bring in more federal funding because of course that Medicaid is matched by the federal funds. So um, Catherine's, and there's a second piece as well. Um, historically, this is a little technical, so forgive me, but, but it's close to my heart. Historically, all of NAMS has, has been the hospital. Even the outpatient services were meeting the hospital accreditation standards. So in order to um, separate the outpatient services and have them meet outpatient accreditation standards and rules, they will operate like a, more like a doctor's office and less like a hospital. Um, in order to do that, um, we have to have two different people in charge because if it's one organization, then they have to meet one set of standards. So that's a large part of the reason. That will free up a lot of time and um, manpower in the outpatient services that previously has been used to meet some standards that are really um, great standards if they're applied to a hospital. It's a lot of extra work if it's a, what is effectively a doctor's office. So it frees up a lot of time um, that hopefully more people will be able to be helped and we're not doing extra paperwork just for standards. Mm -hmm. Questions about that? Does that make sense? So, but is it, is it because of Jacob primarily or because, because Jacob, now you're saying there's two different... Um, so, so Joe's referring to the Joint Commission yeah, that's, and that's a regulatory body that we are accredited by at NAMS. Um, Joint Commission has different sets of standards. So there's a hospital set, there's a, what's called the behavioral health care set, which is for outpatient mental health services. Um, there's a laboratory set of standards. There's, they have multiple choices you can pick from. So we would have the outpatient meet the um, behavioral health care manual. They have these big and the hospital would be for the, on the uh, hospital manual. Make sense? Um, it really, for people coming in for services, probably, for, certainly in the hospital, it won't look a lot different. Um, you might catch me in the building now because I've moved back in over there, so if you want to come say hi. Um, on the outpatient side, right now, it's not looking a lot different. I expect in the next few months we'll see some more um, organizational changes. 
Um, the state, the Division of Public and Behavioral Services, which is Behavioral Health Services, which we're part of, is um, working really hard on a number of initiatives. Um, one of those is the implementation of ACA. Um, because, and there have been some changes to Medicaid. So people who are entering Medicaid in this area are going into um, HMO, managed care services, not into people service. So um, that means they have providers available to them that would not have otherwise previously been available through those HMOs. So we're working with Medicaid and the two H, the two uh, Medicaid managed care organizations, which are AmeriGroup and HPN, to get um, their people who are covered under those services connected with their providers. So we should see some reduction in the demand of the services at the state facility. Um, we're not, at this point, we're not seeing as much of that in the north as we're seeing in the south. Um, mostly because in the south there's a lot larger pool of providers that Amerigroup and HPN can contract with to provide those services. It's, it's a little more limited up here. They're doing a lot of work to try to build those um, services up. And the division, in addition to us reorganizing how we do business um, and working with HP and their group, uh, the division has what are being called pipeline, workforce pipeline programs. And so that initiative is aimed at increasing the number of uh, qualified professionals in the community. Um, one of the really exciting pieces that just happened um, we have at NAMS and Lakes Crossing and Rural Services established an internship for psychologists. So um, that is previously in Northern Nevada, it was the VA. If you were doing your psychology internship, it was the VA. That was your choice. If they didn't have slots, we were done. So um, we'll have four interns next year and we're hopeful that in within two years we'll be able to have that internship program accredited by the APA, and that should really um, be a boost to the availability of psychology services in the area. Um, in addition, because, because if you went to the UNR psychology program, you almost everybody had to go some else, someplace else to do the internship, and then they don't come back. Yeah, yeah. Well, get some, you may get some more. Uh, right, so, so this hopefully will start keeping people in the area. Um, in addition to psychologists, they're working on a pipeline for um, APRNs, and many of you may know that APRNs. I've talked about that for years. Yes. Trying to do that APRNs are the workhorses of our medical staff. Um, they provide a wonderful service. So they're working on that. They're working on um, social workers, MFTs, various various groups of professionals to try to increase, and those projects are statewide, so it would benefit all of Nevada. Um, another major initiative that the division is supporting with partnership from the Children's Cabinet is the planning and implementation of the RAISE model statewide. This is a model that SAMHSA supports for the early identification and intervention of um, people who are having a first psychotic episode. Um, and, and I bet some of you could um, better explain than I can how important it is to intervene early and catch those folks, get them connected with um, the appropriate services. And I know there's actually evidence that that prevents brain damage. So um, this is really exciting. The target group is 15 to 22. Um, and there's a wide swath of community members involved with the project. Um, Children's Cabinet got a grant to lead the project and they're doing their planning year now um, and they hope to have a, a pilot project implemented before the end of this first grant year. So it's a very exciting um, project. And the model has shown great success in other places. Questions about that? I'm not sure. The RAISE model? Because we did, I remember thinking back a few years, um, Las Vegas did some stuff about um, screening kids in school for mental health um, issues. Mm -hmm. you know, for, for mental health. 
Yeah, this is this is aimed at people who had an, an episode of psychosis uh, and, and finding them and getting those services in place the first time it's identified. So, um, really exciting that within a couple of years, hopefully Nevada will really be seeing some benefit from that. Target audiences, so to speak, are, 
and where we might best fill the gaps until there are other community providers that want to do that. Um, so, yes? Are you talking uh, about the evidence-based practice of the integrated dual diagnosis treatment? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, and the division is working towards a more uh, co-occurring capable setting even within ourselves. We have some, some services. Um, they certainly have room for improvement, and we're working on that. And led a lot by Dr. Woodard, if you know Stephanie. Okay, so. So I have a question. Um, if you on the is that there is not yet a truly integrated dual and three is there? I mean, sequential. No, no, not a not a fully co-occurring. No. Are there in Sacramento? Because I've had patients. I've had people come. That I don't know. I would, I would hazard to guess there may be, but I don't know what they are. Mark? Yeah, uh, I do uh, a dual diagnosis uh, groups, uh, three of them, mm -hmm. three uh, weeks. Uh, and uh, I just, my question is, do you know when we, um, as, as the state, um, going to get involved in doing a program? Um, so we have the program we you're talking have, about. We have, we have some we have, we places, have pieces in place. Yeah, it's a process program. Right. But it's not a program that's presented from the state. Yeah, he reads, he reads the DRA. Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. Yes. Um, the state, I can't tell you a date, Mark. I can't tell you a date right now. Um, but part of the reorganization that Catherine's working on and some of the things that Dr. Woodard is working on with her are about um, making sure that we're maximizing the resources we have available currently. Um, and that really gets to the, I really, I, governor's recommended budget was the first thing on my list and maybe it would help a lot if I covered it. <laughs> um, so the governor's recommended budget was released in January. Um, for NAMS, what the recommended budget, and that's public, what is in the budget for us here is um, some very modest increases based on caseload. And now I just told you that we're working to try to get, to try to reduce some of those caseloads. Um, but the way the budgeting process works, we have to use the data that's available to us at the time, which is about six months ago when we developed this. So at that time, our caseloads were going up. So we have some very modest um, increases requested for resources in our outpatient services, which translates to we requested a few new staff in outpatient. Um, the hospital would not grow. It remains 30 beds. There are no reductions in the governor's recommended budget. So there would be no layoffs, no, um, there's been a few rumors. You guys can help me tell everybody. No, nothing in that budget recommends any reductions for us. Um, there is that expectation over time that um, we will pay for that budget by collecting revenue. So. That's what it's based on, and it, it continues. So it was more like that this last two years than it's ever been before, and that gets even more so in this budget for fiscal years 16 and 17. So um, really critical that we are being efficient and effective and maximizing those um, services that are reimbursable. I do know why, and uh, it's, it's, there were several years when uh, NAMS ran with very few patients in it, 
And over the last two years, it's been very um, consistent that we have a small number of people, small compared to most states, number of people waiting in the ERs on a daily basis. This morning it was 16. Mm -hmm. um, we are the public hospital that receives patients for every emergency room north of Tonopah. Uh, we're the only public psychiatric hospital for all of those emergency rooms. So um, there's, they're having, and the reason there isn't an increase in this budget for in NAMS beds yeah. is that there are um, other psychiatric hospitals uh, in the community that have expressed interest and are willing to provide that increase um, if it's necessary. So uh, West Hills Hospital and Carson Taco Hospital, and maybe at some point some of the other uh, acute care hospitals might be willing to open psychiatric beds. Um, and again, the government doesn't want to be competing with those um, providers. We want to provide those services that can't be provided elsewhere. Now, what the state's done to help with that solution is, again, changes to the Medicaid process. And so the rate that hospitals can be paid, and a, an acute care hospital can be paid um, at a certain rate by Medicaid, and that rate has gone up. Now, my hospital can't get paid by Medicaid directly because we are an institute for mental disease. And other freestanding psychiatric hospitals, unless you're attached to like a renown, you can't get paid because we're excluded in the Medicaid, the Social Security Act. Um, we can make an arrangement with those um, MCO companies, Amerigroup and HPN, to get paid for those inpatient services. Uh, so the goal is, and we're having a lot of talks with Carson Taco and um, West Hills and others, and they're taking more of those patients, um, and we're working through with with them about um, how to best manage some of the, you know some of the folks that, for example, they may not have had that population before, and, um, and we're making progress. But I agree with you; um, it's not ideal, obviously, for anybody to wait in the ER. That just seems unacceptable. That is absolutely not our goal. And uh, I do know, I've heard just just tonight somebody. Who was diagnosed or was down on the record street, found her way down to Carson, and I'm not sure how she got down there, but she was seen at Carson Tahoe and had a uh, six, seven day stay at Carson Tahoe. So. Well, and the community's coming up with some really good solutions as far as, you know, one of the challenges is transportation. Um, even for uh, the, the uh, Rural Hospital Association has been really great about working with us on. Um, ways we can use technology to help with these things. We're working on a project with them now about um, formulary so that um, their hospitals in the rural areas can have the medications, the, the most um, used medications on hand um, rather than just a couple of, you know, kind of held all and, and not much else. Um, so that they're prepared to help right from the beginning and maybe prevent somebody from having to come to another community and, um, you know, that can't be a very wonderful experience. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of solutions are coming up in this, but um, I agree with you. And, and one of the things that I'm really grateful for about this reorganization um, that allows me to focus on inpatient is that gives me the time I need to focus on, um, you know, these folks have been here an awfully long time what resources do we need so that they can graduate from the hospital and we can get those people from the emergency rooms in? Because, so, because some will just walk, some will just leave, you know, horribly psychotic. Or, you know, could walk. happen. Yeah. Um, and some of the other hospitals are, like I say, West Hills is, has empty space. They've expressed interest in using it. Um, some of the other uh, facilities are interested in expanding, so it's it's an exciting time a lot of solutions are really starting to break through. But it's um, also a challenge because uh, the way I've always known us to do business and the way many of us have known NAMS to do business, it has to change quite a bit. So, uh, other things in the legislative session, there is a bill, or two bills, AB 38, 
and SB7 are slightly different versions of, maybe, maybe you guys know more about this than I do, slightly different versions of changes to the legal 2000 process um, that would change a little bit who can initiate and who can um, decertify uh, the, the legal 2000 hold, um, particularly physician assistance being added if there are some other, um, other minor changes. Neither of those has passed yet. Um, they're, they're, and they're winding their way through. They have been heard in committee. Um, if they don't, SB7 had passed through a committee. So that gets it through the first deadline. So it's, it's got a little bit of traction. So we're, we're still watching it carefully to see how it goes. And uh, Teresa Benitez, the Senate woman Benitez, spoke to us about it. Mm -hmm. And she said it would be for um, nurses, but I wasn't sure it was advanced practice nurses to be in, you know, uh, able, able to to do uh, legal system. Yeah, it includes nurses, mm -hmm. the RNs. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure Mrs. Benitez Thompson was much more eloquent about it. <laughs> <laughs>